66. Now the next measurement. What are we trying to do? What is the next question? What is the central axis of the face? This one here is 83. It should be 90. And that's clinical deviation is 3 also. 83 is pretty bad. That tells you that it's going south. North is up. South is down on the map. So when it's going down, it's going south. Even if it doesn't change, it's still going south because it's headed in that direction. That is the central axis of the face. Next, we come up to the facial angle. What does it represent? Indicator for mandibular pragmatism. And that changes with age. How much does it change? One degree every three years. In this group of children, it was 85 and it went to 88. That's three degrees in nine years, just like the book says. So you can't use the facial angle unless you know the age of the patient. How much? 85. Did you go? All right. Now notice where we put these numbers. I put this one here, I put this one here, and I put this one here. And that's posted on the tracing. This is a group of patients, so it's a composite. But in that 70, 73 patients, it's 59. We say it's 60. It's 89, and we say it's 90. It's 85, and we say it should be 86. So these, this group of patients are just a little bit on the retrognathic side according to our standards. But next, what's the next issue as we come around? The convexity of the face. Right? Convexity. Maxillary convexity, A to the facial plane. This is the next thing we come up with. Page 3, it should be 4.5 millimeters. It changes. Changes a uh, uh, millimeter about every 3.5 years. So in this group of patients here, we started out at age 6 with 4 millimeters of convexity. We end up at age 18 with 2 millimeters of convexity. Naturally, with no treatment. So, patients with normal growth of the face grow out of convexity because the chin is growing forward faster then point A is moving forward in the face. Point A moves forward with nasion, essentially. And as the face grows, it overtakes the maxilla. Now the next thing we look at maybe would be the palate. Number five. Okay. Palate plane should be essentially parallel to Frankfurt plane. And it should be parallel to the Frankfurt plane. But I showed you yesterday a patient that had been changed six degrees with extra oral traction. It's very difficult to find any case that changes without treatment. Look, this palate, this palate drops down almost parallel to the Franklin plane. So that's what you can expect. This one is plus three. Anything up is plus, and anything down is plus. All right, the next. We're coming now to the oral nomon. Right. When we first did our work, we found 47, then we reduced it to 46. Then Slavicek came along and said it was 45. <laughs> we found 46 again. <laughs> As a mean of all of our cases. If you notice, this is 46 and 46. <laughs> of all of the angles that I measured, there's two that seem to be very, very reliable. One is <coughs> Bayesian, Bayesian A, and perhaps even more of a constant 
is anterior nasal spine xi pm. It's amazing. もう驚くほどです。Absolutely amazing. あっと驚くほどです。Why? なぜでしょうか Because the only thing that keeps them apart is T. And what you're looking at is a constant between two bones that have no connection except muscle and teeth. I think that's fantastic. We've known this for a long time. Now, during the course of treatment, I also, with the tipping of the palate, can reduce that oral nomon. When that oral nomon starts to open up, and you've got an open bite, でオープンバイトになると、you better ship that patient out to the worst friend you have, because you got problems, my friend. When the oral nomon is already open and it's opening more, もうすでに開いてる状態、開いてる状態のオーラルノーマンがもっと開いてきたら、watch out. もう自殺行為。But you got a real problem. What happens when it's over fifty? She's going south a little bit. See? Now you can begin to see why I serially extracted this patient. I extracted her case. Now we come down to the mandibular plane. Mandibular plane really expresses ramus height. What do we say the height should be? Here we said it should be 26. It should be 27, it was 26. 23, now it's 22. 23であるのにあるべきなのが20。だいたい一致してます。ここは。Now all of these measurements so far are skeletal. The next thing we'd like to know is the emplacement of the denture. I suppose it should start with the occlusal plane. We don't give it that much attention. The occlusal plane. We don't. No. あんまりオクルーザルプレーンが注意は払えませんけど、まあ、一応見ます。ザイポイント。ザイポイント。ザイポイント。ザイポイント。ザイポイント。ザイポイント。ザイポイント。ザイポイント。ザイポイント。ザイポイント。ザイポイント。ザイポイント。And the tip of the lower incisor should be on the golden position. That's what you should see. And back here, the occlusal plane should be just about on side point because the curve drops down a little bit. All right, the next parameter then is the position of the lower incisor to APO plane. Most orthodontists would prefer to see it at plus two now. It comes from behind. As the lower incisor erupts, it comes up like this. So by the time it's fully erupted, it tends to hold pretty well with its original position. As the face uprights, from the corpus axis, the lower incisor moves back. You notice the occlusal plane is almost a constant to the to the corpus axis, but not exactly. Drops down a little bit in the back, more than it does in the front. Notice that the maxillary teeth have erupted downward and forward away from the palate. As the mandible grows, the upper denture is carried a little bit on the maxilla. The last thing we're looking at now is the position of the upper molar. So we measure the front end of the lower arch and the back end of the upper arch. When the first permanent molar erupts, we used to say it was age plus three years. So at age seven, it should be ten. At age eight, it should be eleven. Our data suggests that it's not quite three; it's two point two point seven or something like that. All right. Now with these figures, you can communicate. Remarkably well. There's only 11 measurements there. Put one in for the occlusal plane and side point, and you got 12. So with those measurements, you can communicate with anybody in the world. You got somebody else in the bioprogressive study club. You got a problem case. Okay, I've got a patient now with 
the 75 degree facial axis. Immediately, you know. I mean, look at all that tells you. Or I got one with 95. Immediately. You're communicating. The nature of that case. To everybody concerned. Okay. All right, I'm going to quit now. It's, it's 9.30 and I think we don't want to wear you out. I've been at it for a long time. Now, so. And uh, we'll start in the morning and try to finish up the front. Then I want to move rather rapidly through the muscles. So I'll give you a lecture on the principles of muscle first thing in the morning. The principles of nerve. It's one of the best lectures I think that I get. So tomorrow's Thursday, and we want to get get you through the muscles, show you the possibilities of treatment, look at some composites, do some growth forecasting in preparation, then to start talking about mechanics on Saturday. Let me congratulate you. You're doing very well. Very bright group. Happy to be your friend. Last spring, after I published my books, I had been working on my books since 1962. So that's 28 years to publish one book. Actually, I got a lot more done than that. So it wasn't uh, quite 28 years old working on one book. And I sat down to write a paper on the long range forecast. I don't know what kind of research you would say that uh, it took to develop the long range forecast because it was a feedback procedure. We started out with computer composites, of which you're seeing here. In the beginning, they were hand generated, and uh, we found that the mandible was bending. And to make it simple, we found it was growing on an arc. I'll go through some slides and show you what happened. But we would try something, and if it didn't work, we'd discard it. If we tried something else, it seemed to work, why well, we'd keep it. So I realized then, when I started to write up the long range forecast, that I was a little bit short in good data, which would satisfy the scientific community. So we started looking around for cases that we could use for testing of, of the, uh, the theory of the forecast. And I called several of my friends at different institutions, and we accumulated then 133 cases in long range. So we sat down and traced them all in time one at the beginning. Some of them we obtained and went all the way from age four to 35 years of age, a growth period of over 30 years. Uh, some of the females we didn't start until seven, and they, we found out that they finished growing at 14 years and eight tenths, or 14 years and nine months, nine to ten months. So what we wanted to do then, first of all, was to find out our cutoffs for the males and females and see whether or not the ideas that we had previously still hold up. Some of the things we put in the literature 20 years ago. And what you see here then is 73 of the patients with no treatment whatsoever over a period of approximately 10 years. Now what you see there is a position one, and if you will notice there, then the, the position one up here, we find in this particular group of patients that escaped orthodontics, that they had a little bit of closure of the facial axis. Did you notice? There was a little shift between the Frankfurt plane and the, the pterygoid vertical and basion nasion, as you see. But even at that, it's pretty close, isn't it? You now know the growth on the facial axis. Precisely as we anticipate. It's 23 millimeters here. And it was nine and a half years. 
So you see, it's just almost exactly as we have been talking about all this time. If we break this down into position two, you see the Bezionesione at 73 patients. And there you are, just about what we've been saying. It did come forward just a tiny bit statistically. And now, from Nasion, the nose at the middle right here. We've always said grew a millimeter and a half. Uh, this group of patients grew 9.64 years. Why that? 9.64 times 1.5 equals 14.46. It's uh, 13. A little short. All right. Now we said that the nose from the internasal spine that grows one millimeter a year. And then we that would be 9.64 and it's 0.9. Anyway, it looks like we're very close to being in the ballpark with what we've been saying all the way down. We said that the lower first molar, once it comes into the mouth, now at this age, when these were started at age 7, 6.6, .6, then we said that the lower molar grows 0.5 a year, and the occlusal plane stays almost constant relative to the corpus axis. It's 0.4, so we're just a tiny bit under all of our data that we have before. Now we found that females grow just a little bit less than males. At age six, females are smaller than the boys at that age. So already the boys are bigger. I would, I had always assumed, and most of the other workers with growth in children have assumed that the boys and girls are about the same. In fact, is broadbent shows half and half in his in his uh, syllabus that we find that the boys are bigger both the untreated and the treated groups before treatment show that the boys are ahead of the girls in size even before they get their their mixed dentition these kind of findings are most encouraging for uh, the work that we've done already